Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. As I've already said, this is a real turning point chapter in the book of the Revelation. Without understanding chapter 12, the same thing as I said at the beginning of chapter 11, without understanding chapter 11 and chapter 12, you cannot understand the rest of the book of the Revelation. So these are two critically important chapters. We've already covered chapter 11 in two of our uh, messages ago, and so today we are now arriving at Revelation chapter 12. Father, bless the teaching of your word. Help me to say everything that you would want me to say and to say nothing that should not be said. May your Holy Spirit illuminate the hearts and the minds of all who watch and listen. In Jesus' name, amen. I agree with Matthew Henry regarding this chapter. Listen very carefully. It is generally agreed by the most learned expositors that the narrative we have in this and the following chapters is not a prediction of things to come. Are you listening? Yes. Is not a prediction of things to come, but rather a recapitulation and representation of things past, which as God would have the apostle to foresee while future, he would have him to review now that they were past, that he might have a more perfect idea of them in his mind and might observe the agreement between the prophecy and that providence that is always fulfilling the scriptures. So here at chapter 12, we are not going forward in chronological order. If you remember, I told you very early on in this series that much of the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. In chapters 12 through 19, the Lord retells the fall of Jerusalem with many details that were left out initially. The trailer was given at the beginning in chapter 6 for horsemen. I told you that then. That was a trailer of the destruction. The general description of Jerusalem's destruction was given in chapters 8 through 11. Now the details and specifics of the destruction are given in chapters 12 through 19. So the Lord is taking us through this very carefully. He's given us a review, uh, an overview, then he gave us a general description, and now he's giving us details and specifics, beginning here in, in chapter 12. This chapter summarizes the fulfillment of the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, speaking of, of the Lord, and thou shalt bruise his heel, speaking of Satan. So the enmity between Satan and the Lord, which was foretold in Genesis chapter 3.15, is fulfilled in this chapter of Revelation. Now we are introduced in verses 1 and 2 to the persecuted woman. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, 
and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. First of all, a woman clothed with the sun. This persecuted woman clothed with the sun is the early Hebrew remnant church. Again, this is the early Hebrew remnant church. Scriptures refer to the Hebrew believers as the church in the wilderness, Acts chapter 7 and verse 38. Remember that, that Jesus came to John in the wilderness of Judea to be baptized of him. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Mark chapter 1 verse 9. And it came to pass in those, day, in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. By the way, that is about a hundred miles distance, which means Jesus walked 100 miles to be baptized. Now this is important, and this is probably something you haven't heard because again of the failure of evangelical preachers to teach the truth. Jesus was baptized at about or exactly the place where Joshua led the children of Israel across the Jordan River into the promised land. At the very spot where Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, that is the spot where Jesus was baptized. The church in the wilderness refers not only to the Old Testament Israelites led by Moses, but also the greater Moses, Jesus Christ, who came to the wilderness of John to be baptized and thus begin his deliverance of God's new covenant people as Joshua delivered the children of Israel from the wilderness to the promised land. Jesus is delivering the new covenant people of God from the wilderness of the old covenant and from the spiritual Egypt of Jerusalem. So the location was very, very important where Jesus was baptized, and now you know why. The church in the wilderness, the collective body of God's chosen people, hence used to denote the whole body of the faithful under the gospel, so say Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Again, the collective body of God's chosen people, the church in the wilderness. This is the reason why the Jews murdered Stephen he proclaimed to them that Jesus was the greater Moses, the new covenant Moses. He came to deliver them from their sins and from their bondage to the law. Acts 7.37, hear Stephen. This is that Moses, speaking of Christ, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you your brethren, like unto me, a deliverer and a miracle worker, him shall ye hear. Again, speaking of Jesus. Him shall ye hear. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up. Him shall ye hear. Not me. Him, when he comes, you should listen to him. He was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. 
Jesus had already referred to himself as the greater Jonah in Matthew 12, 41, as the greater Solomon in Matthew 12, 42, as the greater Jacob in John 4, 11 through 13, the greater Abraham in John 8, 53 through 56. Now here, Stephen declared Christ to be the greater Moses and the Jews murdered him for saying that. Notice too that the church is always referred to in the feminine. Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Wife, church. 2 Corinthians 11.2 For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Revelation 19.7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, the church, hath made herself ready. Revelation 21.9, and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, we'll get to that, saying, come up hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Church is always referred in the feminine. John is describing in this chapter two women. Well, let me rephrase that. In the book of Revelation, John is describing two women. Number one, the persecuted woman in this chapter, chapter 12, which represents the early church, pure and clean. And number two, the great whore in chapter 17. John provides several contrasts between these two symbolic women in the book of Revelation. Now the phrase clothed with the sun in verse 1. You need to read Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun capital S-U-N, of righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. So obviously, this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So this persecuted woman, the early church, is clothed with the sun. Also in verse 1, and the moon under her feet. Okay, this is important. How you translate, uh, interpret this, is important. Now, this is, a, this is an occasion where I disagree with Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry says the moon represents the world. But in all honesty, I've, I've, I've looked at that, studied that, and it, it doesn't resonate at all with the context of this passage. Bishop Thomas Newton, who lived from 1704 to 1782, gave what I believe is the accurate interpretation of that phrase, the moon under her feet. Adam Clark summarizes uh, Thomas Newton's interpretation of this. And I want you to listen carefully to this because this is so pertinent and point spot on. Bishop Newton understands this, the moon under her feet understands this of the Jewish typical worship and indeed the mosaic system of rites and ceremonies could not have been better represented for it was the shadow of good things to come. The moon is the less light ruling over the night, deriving all of its illumination from the sun. In like manner, the Jewish dispensation was the bright moonlight night of the world and possessed a portion of the glorious light of the gospel. At the rising of the sun, the new covenant gospel, at the rising of the sun, the night is ended and the lunar light no longer necessary. 
as the sun which enlightens her shines full upon the earth. Exactly in the same way has the whole Jewish system of types and shadows been superseded by the birth, life, crucifixion, death, resurrection, ascension, and intercession of Jesus Christ. So beautifully expressed and so accurate in its interpretation of what he was saying by the moon under her feet, the moon being the Judaic system, the Mosaic system is now under the feet of the church. It's been replaced by the glorious new covenant gospel of Christ. Now notice also verse one, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. These 12 stars represent the 12 apostles. Daniel 12, 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. These stars are not stars of the galaxy. They're talking about individuals. And here they represent the 12 apostles. Verse 2, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. This is the persecution of Herod surrounding the birth of Christ and later the persecution of the early church by the Pharisees and the Romans. This chapter <clears throat> is a summary of the great persecutions by Satan against Christ, the apostles and the early church leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. So this chapter takes us back to the beginning of the New Covenant era. And now we are seeing the satanic attack against Christ from the time of his birth and the persecution that followed by the Pharisees and the Romans throughout the early church period. Verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. A great red dragon. John clearly identifies this dragon in verse 9. Skip down to verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Notice the description. That old serpent in the Garden of Eden called the devil and Satan. So the dragon is none other than Satan himself. Having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Okay, the seven heads represent the Roman Empire operating under Satan's power. We've referenced this before, and we're going to see it again when we get to chapter 17. But for now, Revelation 17, 9. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Rome, built on seven mountains, on which the woman, not the persecuted woman, but the great whore, sitteth. The great whore of Revelation 17, 18, and 19 sits on the seven mountain empire of Rome. We'll study that in detail when we get to that part of Revelation. The seven crowns upon the seven heads are the seven kings of the Roman Empire before and during the early church period as we described in prophecy message number seven, when did John write the book of Revelation? And that is contained in prophecy package 
set to. In that message, we went into depth to discuss that. So the seven crowns on the seven heads are the seven kings of the Roman Empire before and during the early church period, as we've already described. The ten horns according to Matthew Henry, are divided into ten provinces as the Roman Empire was by Augustus Caesar. Close quote. So the ten horns are the ten provincial rulers of the Roman Empire. This comports with Daniel chapter 7 with the little horn being Antiochus Epiphanes, and I'm going to take time to read from Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 of chapter 7 and verses 24 and 25 of chapter 8. Okay, listen carefully to Daniel's prophecy. And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, this would be Rome, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all of the beasts that were before it. The great empires preceding the Roman Empire. It was diverse from all of those. And it had ten horns. Again, these would be the ten provincial rulers of the Roman Empire. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things. And the ten horns, the ten provincial rulers, out of this kingdom, the fourth kingdom, Rome, following the empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, are ten kings that shall rise, the ten Roman provincial rulers, and another shall rise, after them, this would be the little horn, and he shall be diverse from the first. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High, blasphemy. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High, persecution, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And I've explained to you before, when you see that phrase, time and times and the dividing of time, that's talking about 42 months or three and a half years. Go back and watch Prophecy Message 15 on the seventh trumpet in the fall of Jerusalem where we go into considerable detail on this. And so this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes who persecuted the Jews and ravaged the temple and the city of Jerusalem for exactly the period of time that Daniel predicted, 42 months or three and a half years. Now Calvin, John Calvin, said that the little horn was Julius Caesar. Luther said the little horn was the Turks. I agree with Matthew Henry that the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8 was Antiochus Epiphanes, as I've said. Listen to Matthew Henry. This prophecy, Daniel, has primarily referenced the Syrian, the Seleucid Empire, operating under the favor. Let me just divert here just briefly because this is the context that we're discussing here in Revelation. <clears throat> when the empire rose to power and began subduing all of the nations around it. Antiochus, the Syrian ruler, resisted the Roman 
power and tried to fight against it. He quickly discovered that he was completely outmatched and recognized the vast power of Rome. So what Antiochus did, instead of trying to continue to fight Rome, he presented himself as a distant sub-ruler of the Roman Empire. He bargained with Rome, and they allowed him to be an Arab sub-empire of the Roman Empire, not part of the ten provinces, but he would be more or less an eleventh province, which would mean he was the little horn. And this is what, and this is what Matthew Henry is saying. This prophecy was primarily referenced to Syrian Empire and was intended for the encouragement of the Jews who suffered under Antiochus, that they might see even these melancholy times foretold, but might foresee a glorious issue of them at last in the final overthrow of their proud oppressors, which happened under the great Maccabean revolt. By that time, Antiochus was no longer leading the armies in Judea, but uh, nevertheless, his forces were defeated by the, the, the Maccabean revolt, just as is being predicted here in our passage in Daniel. And which is best of all might foresee not long after the setting up of the kingdom of the Messiah in the world with the hopes of which it was usual with the former prophets to comfort the people of God in their distresses. That's a quote from Matthew Henry. So I'm agreeing with him that this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8. Now, if you want more information on this, go back and watch Prophecy Message number 6, Ezekiel's Gog and Magog Prophecy, which is in Prophecy Package Set 1. And I go into great detail talking about all of that. Now, verses 4 through 6. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, Satan, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth, okay, ready to be born. Who does that remind you of? Herod. Remember Herod? When he found out that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem and, and how Herod went and tried to kill the Messiah, sent his soldiers, and you, you remember the story, right? So this is speaking of Herod, ready to be delivered, to destroy the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Again, three and a half years or 42 months. Once more, this chapter is a summary of the great persecutions by Satan against Christ the apostles, and the early church leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember, we have gone back to the beginning and we're seeing events that were not told to us earlier in the book of Revelation. Verse 4, And his tail, Satan, drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Again, we're not talking about the the stars of the, of the galaxies and so forth. These are individuals, in this case, angels. And he drew the third part of the stars or the angels of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And at that point, they became demonic spirits. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The third part of the stars of heaven are the angels who were deceived by Satan shortly before the birth of Christ and were used to try and destroy Jesus soon after his birth, again, Herod the Great, and afterward 
to mercilessly and relentlessly attack Christ and his followers. As you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have to be impressed with how many references there are to Jesus' encounters with demonic spirits. Is, are, you know enough about the gospel to understand what I'm saying, correct? Yes. Almost every chapter, there is an encounter between Jesus and the demonic spirits. Well, verse 4 explains that. One-third of the angels before Jesus' birth followed Satan, becoming demonic spirits, and were there on the earth to first try and prevent the birth of Christ, which failed, and then persecuting Jesus everywhere he went. I mean, you and I have to face Satan's ambassadors from time to time. Depending upon our effectiveness for Christ and our loyalty to Christ and our service for Christ, we will face the imps of hell in our service for Christ. But none of us will face the barrage of demonic attack that Jesus faced when he was on this earth. Every day of his earthly existence, almost every hour, perhaps you could say almost every minute of his existence on earth, he was confronted by the forces of hell, the demonic spirits, these stars that had fallen from heaven, becoming the demonic enemies of Jesus right before his birth. Verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Underline that, rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This verse is pretty amazing, actually. In this one statement, in verse 5, we have a synopsis of King Jesus from his birth to his ascension, to his judgment upon Jerusalem. All of that is stated in verse 5. His birth, his ascension, his judgment upon Jerusalem. Psalm 2, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. What does verse, verse 5 say? Rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2, 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Many of you will recall that this verse, Psalm 2, 9, is used in Handel's Messiah, describing the destruction of Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Those are the words of Christ. This is the same chapter, Revelation 2, where Jesus discusses, quote, where Satan's seat is and quote the synagogue of satan close quote so in that passage the context that rod of iron ruling them with a rod of iron the same thing that is said in psalm chapter 2 verse 9 as a prophecy of the destruction of jerusalem the same thing that we are reading in revelation chapter 12 and verse 5 so this is a discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem. Again, we're going back to the beginning and filling in details that were left out up until chapter 12. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, 
that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. There it is again. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Again, this describes God's judgment upon Jerusalem. Verse 6. And the woman, the persecuted woman, fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Again, the three and a half year period, 40, 42 months. Again, the persecuted woman is the early Hebrew remnant church that was persecuted by both Rome and the Pharisees and that fled to Pella to escape Jerusalem's destruction and remain there for the length of the entire siege, some 42 months or 1,203 score days. At this point, I encourage you to go back and watch my message on the 144,000, the prophecy message on the 144,000, which I go into great detail to describe what now is being repeated in chapter 12. Verse 7. Okay, now the scene changes from earth to heaven, just like in chapter 15. And there was, chapter 11, excuse me, and there was war in heaven, war in heaven. So now the focus is going to heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon, Satan, was cast out of heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives under the death. These verses describe the spiritual war in heaven taking place at the same time as the verses that we read before verse 7. So while everything was going on in earth that we read about in verses 1 through 6, now we temporarily take a, a gander at heaven and we see the spiritual war. It's a shame. I shouldn't say it that way because it's God's providential plan for us. But humanly speaking, it's a shame that we are not able to see the spiritual war in heaven going on while we are fighting the spiritual wars on earth. The spiritual wars in heaven are far greater in magnitude than the spiritual wars on earth. The spiritual wars on earth are but a reflection and a byproduct of the spiritual wars in heaven. Can you imagine, get, use your imagination a little bit, and get a glimpse of Satan and his demonic forces fighting a literal battle in heaven against Christ and his angels, all of which would determine the extent of Satan's power on this earth. 
In, in chapter 11 and verse 15, if you remember, when we were introduced to the beginning of the new covenant kingdom, and we talked about that in chapter 11 and verse 15, and that's what most evangelicals miss. Remember, how many times do I have to say this? I probably should say it three or four hundred times to get some people's attention concerning it because it's so out of sync with what evangelicals, and when I say that, you know I'm speaking generally. There are some that are preaching truth in this area. They are a very small minority. Most of them do not recognize the kingdom of God having already come. They're still looking for a future kingdom of God. They're looking for an earthly kingdom of God. And anybody who's looking for an earthly kingdom of God will never see it because there is no such thing. Jesus plainly said, how many times do I need to repeat it? My kingdom is not of this world. It is a heavenly kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. So no matter what your eschatology is, pre, mid, post, and all the titles, put them all together, if they include a future earthly kingdom it is erroneous doctrine Amen. took you a minute to get that i hope everybody that clapped really understood what i'm saying the kingdom of god has come it is here now it is not an earthly kingdom it is a heavenly kingdom and that's what we saw in revelation chapter 11 as god was showing us through john in chapter 11 the destruction of jerusalem when it came to the very end of the destruction and i get, i took you through that then again John is, is told to look to heaven. And he saw the scene in heaven when Jerusalem fell. We're going to get to the reaction of Jerusalem's destruction by the world when we get to later chapters. But if you want to know heaven's reaction... To the fall of Jerusalem, you go to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. And we went over that in detail two messages ago on this subject. So that's what's happening here. The scene is shifting from earth to heaven. God sent his angel of war, Michael, to fight with Satan. And just as with Michael's war with Satan surrounding the death of Moses, so here with God's power, and Michael could not defeat Satan without God's power. If Michael, the archangel of war in heaven, could not defeat Satan without God's power, who do you think you are that you can defeat Satan without God's power in your life? But with God's power, Michael and his forces prevail and Satan is defeated. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
this official casting down of Satan from heaven must have taken place at the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Again, these are the things that you don't see when you read the Gospels. And these are the things you don't see when you read the first 11 chapters of the book of Revelation. So now we're going back to the beginning and God is filling it in. And we see the casting out of Satan from heaven at the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Listen very carefully to what Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 31. Now this is what Jesus said days, just days before his crucifixion. Okay? Days before his crucifixion. Jesus said, John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, Satan, be cast out. And now we have the story told us about the casting out of Satan and his angels. So Jesus told us the chronology, didn't explain it. He explained it through John in Revelation chapter 12, but he foretold it nonetheless. Now, days before his crucifixion, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And he was. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Until the time of Jesus somewhere there between his birth and crucifixion, when he was cast out, he was the great accuser of the brethren for all of history. You remember back in the book of Job, the very first book of the Bible, chapters 1 and 2, what do you see? You see Satan in heaven accusing Job to God, right? Yeah. And the whole rest of the book is the result of that accusation that Satan made against Job. So from the beginning of time until this moment in the life of Christ, Satan was the great accuser of the brethren in heaven making accusation against the believers in Christ day and night. But now he is cast out of heaven. The old accuser is cast out. When you get rid of the accuser, shout glory, hallelujah. Accusers are used of the devil to destroy somebody or something. And he's cast out. And so the loud voice says, Now is salvation and strength come and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ for the accuser is cast down. Being cast out of heaven, Satan's accusations against God's people in heaven ceased. Satan is not in heaven anymore to make any accusation against any Christian. You are not being accused by Satan in heaven. Say glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Verse 11, and they overcame him 
by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Okay, so the early church, the early church believers were victorious over Satan and his forces through the means of these three. Number one, the blood of the Lamb. Number two, the word of their testimony, their faith. Number three, their willingness to die for Christ. And through the means of these three, the early church was victorious over Satan, the one who had planned their destruction even before Jesus was born. And following his birth was relentless in their destruction, but did not succeed. Verses 12 through 17. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell on them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. And you know what that means. From the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of the mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, he didn't succeed against the persecuted woman, so now he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Okay, this is a further recap, verses 12 through 17. This is a further recap of Satan's attack against Christ and the early New Covenant church. All this is about the early church preceding the destruction of Jerusalem. So all of this is about Verse 12, all right, let's explain this. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. <laughs> the interpretations I've heard of that passage, like so many in, in Revelation, they, they just become so bizarre. And it's because, again, so many have lost the true meaning of the book of Revelation, they don't understand the new covenant. They don't understand that the kingdom of God is not of this world. And they're looking for signs and times and all that kind of stuff. And they get bizarre. When it says, he had great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. A short time for what? A short time to stamp out the infant church. He only had a short window of opportunity to stamp out the early church. Every day they survived, every week, every month, every year, he lost more and more opportunity to stamp them out. And so he knew they only had a short time to stamp out the early church. Remember, and I need to say this probably more than I do, the theme of this entire book is God's divorcement 
of old Jerusalem and the preparation of Christ's new bride in the new Jerusalem. This whole book tells the story of God's divorce from Old Testament national Israel and the new bride of the new covenant church in the new Jerusalem. That's what all this is about. So this entire process is the breaking away, the divorcement from the old covenant Israel into the new covenant church, the bride of Christ, and the new Jerusalem. Now the theme of these remaining verses in chapter 12 is the early church exodus. You should put that in your notes somewhere to remember that. The early church exodus. Exodus. Write that somewhere around verse 12. Verse 13 and 14. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, and the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place which she is where she is nourished for a time, a times and half a time from the face of the servant. That three and a half year period of time again this is the persecuted woman the early hebrew remnant church as described in the book of acts jesus prepared them for jerusalem's persecution and its eventual destruction matthew 24 verses 15 and 16 when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Notice the Exodus imagery here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. When the church saw the assembling of the Roman forces in 66 AD, it fled to Pella, the wilderness, into her place, prepared by God to protect her from the serpent. She was protected from the serpent for the duration of the Roman invasion, for a time, times, and half a time, 42 months. So while Jerusalem was being destroyed, totally, thoroughly annihilated, the church had fled to its place, prepared by God, preserved and protected by a loving new covenant savior from the wrath of Satan and from the wrath of God against the satanic forces in the city of Jerusalem. Again, I encourage you to watch the message 10, 144,000, and that's in Prophecy Package Set 2. I explain that in much depth in that message. Remember, Jerusalem had become spiritual Egypt. Remember that? Revelation 11, verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem had become Egypt. So just as God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, so the Lord led the children of the new covenant out of spiritual Egypt, Jerusalem. Amen? It's amazing how this all fits together. It's, I, I, as I prepare this, as I go and study it, I have from the very beginning in the Israel packages when I was so naive as to the true teaching 
of Israel and Bible prophecy. And I was preaching these messages. And I, then as, as I got through the Israel packages and started going into the prophecy packages, it, it just dawned on me, wow, everything fits. You don't, have to, you don't have to try to grab something and make it fit. You don't have to put a, a round peg in a square hole somewhere. And that's what a lot of prophecy guys do. They're taking some round pegs and trying to pound them into a square hole or vice versa. And they're trying to make it fit because they have no real clear, no clear idea of what the truth of the scripture is. And, and so they're, trying, they're making things up and they're trying to make it fit. And when you get done, you've got a hodgepodge of a little bit of Old Covenant, a little bit of New Covenant, a little bit of Jesus, and a little bit of that. And, you, and it's nonsensical. And it dawned on me as I started going into this prophecy series, looking back on the Israel packages, wow, it fits. It fits. There's nothing to force. It just fits. The early, and get this, because I said this is Exodus imagery. The early Hebrew church was delivered in much the same way that the Hebrews were delivered from Pharaoh's Egypt, as I just said. Listen to these verses. Exodus 19.4. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Deuteronomy 32, 11, and 12. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, bearing them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him and there was no strange God with him. So see again, remember those verses? Revelation. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the wilderness into her place. Exodus imagery. Verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. No doubt the remnant of her seed is the Gentile church which was born out of the early Judean church. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the remnant of her seed, the early Hebrew remnant church, the, the remnant of her seed is the Gentile church which was born out of the Hebrew church. And never forget, my brothers and sisters, that we are part of the Gentile church. We are part of the remnant of her seed. Now this means the serpent is at war with us and with you. If you are a blood-bought, born-again child of God, part of the new covenant church of the Lord Jesus Christ, saved by the grace of God through faith in him, you are his enemy as well. As he hated the early church and tried to destroy it, 
He hates the church today and tries to destroy it. Which means us. You better be sure that you are wearing the whole counsel of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because you're not going to defeat Satan without God's power and protection. You're not going to do it. And if you're living in rebellion against God and you're living in disobedience against God and you're ignoring God's will for your life, you will face unprotected this great red dragon who hates us with a passion of hatred not known in this world. Our next prophecy message I didn't even finish. Our next (laughs) prophecy message will cover the chapter that everybody wants to talk about. Chapter 13. The beast, the mark, and the number of his name. Oh, that'll be our next one. And once again we're going to understand the misinformation that prevails among evangelicalism today and show you what that chapter is really all about. That'll be our next prophecy message, Revelation chapter 13. The beast, the mark, and the number of his name. I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll be watching online. And I trust this message in chapter 12 has cleared up things and helped you understand things like you haven't before and was a blessing to you. Are you glad you came to the Liberty Project today? Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.